Well, it's mid-November in Western Washington. Have you quit bass fishing? Normally in November, our water temperatures are dropping through that 50 degree range on their way to the high 40s. Unfortunately, with this unseasonably cold overnight temperatures that we've been having and 10 degree lower than normal daytime highs, our water temperatures have crashed. The first week of November, I was already seeing water temperatures in the very low 50s and high 40s, and I haven't seen water temperature a degree over 47, 48 degrees in two weeks. It's not an impossible time of year to catch them. You just kind of really got to get into what you're doing. So it gets a little bit more technical, a little bit more involved, but it's still very, very possible. My November started out with the first week of November catching this and the last week of November catching this. What you're going to run into is a lot of the reaction baits, it's time to put them to bed. A lot of your spinner baits, swim jigs, things like that, unless you can manipulate them, get them deep, you're kind of getting more into uh, finesse fishing. I'll go over why that is. So as we transition from fall to winter, one of the things that you will notice in the climate is we start to get more winds out of the north. Traditionally and predominantly in western Washington, most of our wind comes out of the south-southwest. I've experienced many times and even a couple times earlier this year in my practice videos, I documented a wind direction change just shut the bite off. The bass don't go away, they don't hide, they're still in their same places, but on that one Whatcom practice video I did, I smashed them the first 90 minutes. I mean, it was ridiculous. However, the wind changed 180 degrees from blowing out of the south to blowing out of the north, and the bite just stopped. They were following the bait, they were still looking at the baits, but they were not coming up and hammering reaction baits. So that's a time where I should have just adjusted to drop shot, jerk baits, something that got their attention but then stopped in their face and gave them a chance to really decide to bite it. So you wanna keep that in mind when you're pursuing fish into December, January, and February when you still wanna chase bass. So let's go over the where. So as the water temperatures drop, it is not impossible to catch bass in shallow water. They will get up and cruise. However, that 15 to 25 foot range is going to be much more important in November and December. That is if your lake has access to that depth. And I'll give you two examples. I've got a lake north of me that right now is 22 feet deep maximum. Those fish have been relating to 15 to 20 feet. If you go to a Lake Washington or a Lake Sammamish, if Whatcom was open, or even a Lake Samish up north, especially with smallmouth, smallmouth will start to relate 20, 30, 40, 50 foot depth of water and they'll stay somewhat active if they have access to that depth. If fish don't have access to that depth, what I have witnessed and I have seen happen in lakes at 15, 20 foot and that's your maximum depth, those fish will go belly down in the mud. They will get so tight to cover that's on the bottom, you cannot distinguish them. And they're not moving around a lot. So even with the forward facing sonar and stuff like that, you're not gonna detect a lot of movement until you do something to stir them up. Start it where you would see a spawning flat and work your way deeper. Deep is going to be relative to your lake. If, if your lake's 100 feet deep, those fish are gonna find a depth that's comfortable to them and they're gonna stay active. Maybe not aggressively active, but they're gonna stay active. If you're dealing with a more predominantly shallow lake where it's 15 or less maximum depth, a nice bright sunny day is gonna do more for you than it would for the fish that have found that deep comfortable water. The fish are gonna be somewhat lethargic, but you can still get them to bite. Vertical cover is going to be important because fish can regulate their depth without expending a lot of energy. They can move up a little bit shallower if they want to. They can get down to that deeper water. Docks will still produce, but docks that terminate in or have access to deeper water are gonna be the ones you wanna focus on. The docks up on the shallow flats, you can try it, be my guest. If you wanna go after the best possibility of catching a fish, docks that terminate in deeper water are gonna be worth your investing your time in versus the docks that are on the shallow flats. If your lake has old pilings in it and various depths, Excellent targets. Hard targets. A lot of your vegetation is dying off. More importantly, they're not going to be producing oxygen 
like they do in the spring, summer, and fall. Once they are, they've gone dormant or they're dead, they're no longer producing oxygen. They're still viable cover, but they're not producing oxygen, so they're not as attractive. Hard targets will hold bass better than the softer vegetation targets going through the winter. So let's jump on the deck of my boat and I'll show you what I'm rocking now through the end of February. This stuff will not leave the deck of my boat. So I've personally been staying after largemouth through November. Mainly it's my first love and I just like catching largemouth in the winter because I think it's a, an accomplishment. Smallmouth will stay more active. I don't want to say easier, but it definitely uh, they're going to be more apt to bite your lure if you're in a lake that offers smallmouth. Let's go over some of the baits I've got here just to kind of give you an idea of things that you can use this time of year and will help you catch fish. So my primary drop shot rod, 10 pounds to a fluorocarbon leader. I run this one with a pretty long leader up to four feet and that's so I can manipulate the bait. I want it suspended up off the bottom. If I'm on a big huge old growth log and those fish are up against it, I can still kind of visually see my bait but I can just drop it and let it sink down alongside that log and then raise it back up. This isn't a time where you're putting a lot of action into your baits. You just want them to be there and be available. Another drop shot, however, this one is on a much shorter leader, which that's about as long as I'll go on this rod. I'll even half that if I have to and go about six inches. And this is on six pound fluorocarbon. The reason I'll run six pound fluorocarbon is those fish can get line shy. You know, going from an eight to a six can make a difference between them biting or not biting. These fish are getting such a good look at your bait this time of year that you kind of need everything in your favor to get them to make that last final commitment to bite. And they might look at your bait multiple times before they finally commit to picking it up or, or grabbing a hold of it. So this is again, fluorocarbon line. On this rod, I'll run anywhere from eight to 12 pound test. It is spinning gear, so I don't wanna go too heavy a line. It gets difficult to cast. I'm just running a net head. I'll play around with baits, but it's just something I can crawl on the bottom. I'm still gonna run a jig. Again, this is gonna be when they're hugging the bottom, I still wanna get something down there that's in a jig. I'll run this color and I'll go over some others. This rod right now, my punch and Rig, but this will run another jig but I will take this braided line and I will attach a fluorocarbon leader about 15 pound test and I will just run an opposing color jig just to be more efficient. So color selection in the in the winter is the same as any other time of year, you know, just kind of going towards more natural colors. Stuff that's gonna sit on the bottom, maybe kick those legs up. I'll still run a darker color once in a while, but honest to goodness, I'm more apt to lean towards a whiter color or a lighter color. Something a bit more in a root beer, natural brown color. I really opt for a lot of the greens if I wanna get really subtle, that's a great option. You get a little bit of action out of that tail on that single tail grub. Anywhere three quarter ounce, one ounce if I'm going after small mouth. It will work for large mouth. Uh, I just prefer a standard jig if I'm going after large mouth. Uh, something in these guys, you know, it's another type of uh, football head. For small mouth, you know, these guys, a uh, swim bait on some type of lead head will still get the job done. I think you're, you're better suited throwing something that's a little less aggressive, especially in January and February. Something that you can either keep on the bottom or just kind of slowly drag along the bottom, I think you're gonna up your chances more than if they're gonna chase something down and grab it. So running these heavier jig heads like that, the reason you're doing it is one, if you're fishing for smallmouth or you're fishing in that 30 to 50 foot range, you need to get the thing to the bottom and an eighth ounce or a quarter ounce, it's just gonna take a long time to get down to the bottom with the drag of all that line and everything. But more importantly than that, once they're on the bottom, you get to maintain contact with your bait. Same thing with a drop shot. So let's talk about that. So this is not a time of year where a fish is apt to just take the rod out of your hand. I mean, more often than not, you're going to feel pressure and you're going to want to kind of make sure that, that it's a fish. You may not feel much head shake or movement or any kind of a tug. You might just feel your rod tip load up. You just want to give them a second and then set the hook. It, don't feel pressure and then go, and I'll tell you why. More often than not, your bait is gonna be an opportunistic feeding opportunity. It's not gonna be a situation where it's an aggressive strike or anything like that. It happens to be there, the fish is gonna investigate it and choose to pick it up. They may initially grab half of your bait. It may be more of a strike where they're getting it 
and then getting it. So if they get a hold of it, as they're turning, they'll take that second gulp. So if you're working your drop shot and you're giving it a little bit of movement here and there, but all of a sudden you feel your tip load up like that. A fish is taking it, but give them just a second and let them get that bait. Then lift up and then start reeling and set that hook. With the jig, it's similar. I just like to give them a second. Think about it like a frog bite. When a fish blows up, your initial reaction is whammo. And sometimes you can pull that frog right out of their mouth because they grabbed it to subdue it, but now they're gonna grab it again to really get it in their mouth and get in their crushers. With a frog bite, you wanna see the explosion but you condition yourself to wait that second until you feel weight then you bean them it's very similar with the finesse stuff where you start to feel that pressure you just want to give them a little bit of an extra second and then get them also small fish will still peck small fish still have small mouths so if you're sitting there and you're working on something and you're feeling tick 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 that's a small fish a big fish is still going to come up and just be weight on that bait. Kind of same thing with a jig. That jig's on the bottom. That bass might grab it and pick it up. When you feel that tick on your line, now you wanna wait until you feel the weight of the fish and then set the hook. Now the other thing that's important to do this time of year is detecting the strike. And it's not necessarily gonna be the tip of the rod. A lot of times you wanna have a finger on your line. Your line is that direct connection to that bait. It's the direct connection to that fish. So. When I'm working something on a bait caster, I always have my finger up underneath that line like that. I'm always gonna have a hold of this feeling for anything that my bait's coming through. Obviously, if I feel something pick up my jig, I'm gonna get my finger out of there and then set the hook. You're dragging this along the bottom and working it. You feel more comfortable pulling line out and holding your line like this and working that bait. That's fine, whatever's comfortable for you. I'm pretty good with just using my index finger. That's just what I've gotten comfortable with over the years. Every once in a while, I will hold my line, but I'm pretty good just doing that. But you gotta go with what feels and works best for you. Also on a drop shot, you might wanna hold your line as well here versus using that tip of your rod and when you're working that bait okay so imagine that the floor right here this concrete floor is the surface of the water when I'm working a drop shot my rod tip is going to be pretty much right there when I start to lift I want I want direct connection to that fish I don't want my rod tip high because I'm I'm taking away some of the feel I want the rod to go down and be right on that water so by doing that by keeping my, the tip of that rod that close to the water I'm getting all the sensitivity out of this rod I can get. I still might want to hold my line, but I'm confident enough that I know that if something happens, I'm going to feel it on the tip of that rod. If I'm holding my rod straight out at nine o'clock, I'm taking sensitivity out of the tip of that rod. There's too much line between the, the water and the tip of that rod, and I'm going to lose some of the feeling of it. If I'm holding it up like this, now I'm giving away my chance to get a good hook set. And by the time you reel down in the winter, that fish could have let that bait go. Keep that rod tip low to the water if you're drop shotting, and that'll help your, your sensitivity level and your hookup ratio. All right, if you have access to deeper water fish, one of the things that you'll notice when you catch bass out of really dirty water or deeper water is a lot of times they're starting to lose their pigment. They start to glaze over. They're getting a little bit more bleached out how bleached out that fish is dark water and deep no pigment same thing happens with the bait the bait doesn't have as vibrant or dark a color so you want to think about that when you're thinking about what color bait you're going to use when you're fishing i will still try a darker color bait once in a while just to try it but i'm going to go natural to light colored baits all the way up to white. And this is all about maximizing your time. You have less daylight, it's cold, so you're not gonna wanna be out there as long maybe. Doing the best you can do with your time on the water is what, what it's all about. Those baits are, aren't necessarily the golden rule, but they're the best chance you're gonna have of getting a strike. Your primary baits, again, jig, drop shot, grubs, Carolina rig, and Texas rig are also great options for keeping something on the bottom and just kind of slowly dragging it. If you're gonna run a Carolina rig, 
which is a great time of year for those as well, that leader needs to be longer. And the reason is when that weight moves, that bait will react slower. You don't want a bait with a lot of appendages and movement. You just want like a Senko, some kind of stick bait. I'll still use the good old fashioned worms. That's one of my favorite baits ever on a Carolina rig, but so is the Senko. And Texas rig. I'll Texas rig a four inch Senko and just kind of drag that thing along the bottom with the lightest weight I can get away with, depending on the depth, obviously. All right, get ready for some cutting edge props. If this is a log on the bottom of your lake, okay, this is gonna become very important to bass in December and January. They're gonna plaster up against this thing, probably be their belly in the mud if it's a shallower lake. November and December, what you're gonna find is, if you've got a log on the bottom like that, that's great, but especially in November, if you've got a log that has a branch sticking up off it, where they've got that vertical option, they can follow this up and down and get back to the comfort of that log, this piece of cover is gonna hold bass far more often than just that log by itself. I have two waypoints I've been hitting right now that have that. It's an old chunk of tree and there's one big old branch that comes up off it. Every single time I've been to these two targets, there have been fish on them. Those fish will disappear at, by the end of January. Once we start getting around to that 45 degree water, they're gonna leave that and go deeper. And they're gonna start looking for just those big logs to, to snuggle up against. All that stuff comes into play. The reason I mention that is one of the things that you absolutely have to bring with you in the winter when you're bass fishing is patience. Once you have determined that you have that hard target, you've used your electronics and you have found it, you've used a Carolina rig, a Texas rig or something and you know that that thing is there, now you need to work that piece of cover from every angle you possibly can. I'll do an entire circle around a piece of cover. I can make 10 to 20 presentations at a piece of cover and I see those fish. Sometimes they look at my bait, sometimes they don't. But I find that angle and I bring that bait into the picture it's within 10, 15 seconds, something has latched onto my bait. So you really have to slow your process down where you're not gonna go on the water and fish every dock this time of year. You wanna go to specific targets and put the time into each one of those targets. So you're maximizing your time on a specific target or in a specific area, and then you're moving to another area. And you're, that's what you're doing. You're just kind of hopping around the lake, hitting these, and you wanna come back to them throughout the day. I caught this fish off a piece of cover and I went back the very next day, I went right to it, no fish on that piece of cover. So I went and fished a couple other pieces of cover. About four hours later, I came back and there were fish back on that piece of cover. So these fish, they'll still roam around, uh, they'll still have those times of the day where they're gonna kind of be on the move and they're gonna transition from one piece of cover to another. So you wanna just kind of make those rounds and keep fishing those targets and really pick them apart. They'll commit and usually the quality's better in the winter. You may not have as many bites, but if you do, chances are it's gonna be a four plus pound fish. It's still worth it to get out there. You know, I know a lot of guys kind of pack it in for the winter and that's fine. I hate the cold personally. Going out there is a chore for me, but once I'm on the water, everything just is right and I start to tune in and I'll, I'll go hit my spots and really start to dissect them and kind of try to tune in. And forward facing sonar doesn't catch fish. It'll show you fish and it will frustrate the living crap out of you because you will watch fish after fish after fish swim away from your bait. And it, it's amazing to, to see it. You learn so much about behavior in these bass. It's unbelievable. It's not a magnet. You don't pull up, drop forward facing sonar in the water and bam, 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 bam. You just catch every fish you see. That is not how that stuff works. But you will learn if you pay attention and you understand what's going on, you will start to learn how these fish behave. I won't necessarily say you'll understand it, but you will figure out that if I keep changing angles on this piece of cover, all of a sudden something tickles their fancy and <laughs> bam, they react. Or they've seen your bait enough times that they just finally decide to react. It's pretty wild to watch. It's unbelievable. I just personally prefer baits that are gonna stay in that strike zone, like the drop shot, like a jig. I really want that bait to be not only an easy meal, but a nuisance. You wanna stay in their zone and stay there and stay there and stay there. You're not getting bit, reel in, reposition, cast again, do the same thing, repeat that process eventually they're going to bite. You just have to do it till it happens and then you'll believe it. 
Okay, and the last piece of this entire thing, you gotta butter that toast. This is the time of year where I 100% of the time am using scent on my baits. I really like this stuff because it doesn't freeze, it doesn't gel up. This stuff works for me, I like it, I enjoy it. Kind of like deodorant, you just get some out, but just run that stuff all over. And I'll lay it down on the deck of my boat and do it, but you just wanna run that every friggin' side of that bait. Just coat that thing. The last month or so with forward-facing sonar, I've been watching this happen. So you can disagree with me, but this is what I'm seeing. I'm just relaying that to you guys. These fish will look at this bait and they'll look at it and they'll look at it and then they'll swim 10 feet away. And then eventually they'll kind of loop around and they'll come back and they'll get back on their precious little log. And then you let this thing sink down and then you pick it back up and it's sitting there and they'll come and they'll look at it again, they'll look at it. Their face is right there. Like that last piece of the puzzle is their sense of smell. They see it, it's right there in their face. The action isn't that much. This isn't a bait with a lot of action to it. It's nice and, and soft. It's got good action to it in the water, but this is not a bait where you're making it sit there and do this in the winter. It's just sitting there. That last piece of the puzzle that might make them commit is that scent. And I've watched, it, the last time I was out last week, I watched the fish come up, fish come up. I had just changed my bait. I put a bait on, I threw it out, and I was watching this fish, I was watching this fish, and the fish kept swim away, swim away. I reeled in, I was like, oh, I didn't put any scent on it. I put scent on it, I cast back out, and I caught a fish. This is that time of year where if I'm throwing a jig, the claws of that trailer, I'm sliming up all my drop shots, I'm putting this on there. The really heavily salted grubs and stuff, like the Yamamoto stuff, I may not because that salt needs to be able to get out of that bait and create like that little slime in it. I think it kind of puts a little bit of scent in the water, but anything else that I'm throwing this time of year, I'm gonna butter the toast. I mean, that's just all there is to it. I'm putting this stuff on it and it's going in the water. So if your rivers are getting a little slow and clear and they're getting difficult to fish, or if you caught a salmon or steelhead and the state went, what? Shut it down. And now you can't get out and fish your river. Bass are still accessible. They're accessible right on through the winter time. You just have to put in the time. Number one to finding hard targets. Number two, picking apart those hard targets. And number three, just being out there and putting in that time and learning. That is an excellent thing to do in the winter. Learn stuff. Get out and play with baits. Try stuff. If you've never used drop shots or you're uncomfortable with drop shots, it's a great time of year to get out and play with them. Carolina rigs. It's a great time of year to get out and play with them. If you've got electronics that are new to you, take the manual on a nice, sunny, clear, cold day and get out on the water and go through your electronics, learn them, play with them. They have times of the year where they literally do not matter, but there are times of year like now and I think in the summer, they're critical. It's just so critical to find these pieces of cover so that you can go and pick them apart. So if you want to go fish this winter, number one, make sure you dress properly. Number two, if you look at the forecast for the weather and that wind's going to be coming out of the north, just don't bother. You're gonna have a higher probability of getting bit if the wind's coming out of the south. And I don't care how fast it is, two miles an hour, five miles an hour, 10 miles an hour. If it's coming out of the north, it sucks. If it's coming out of the south, you got a better chance of those fish being more apt to bite. So if you're planning a day to go, make sure you have that. If you wanna plan around the new and full moons, that can give you a little bit of an advantage as well. So play with that, play with the days. You don't have to be out in the pouring rain or in the snow if you don't want to, but uh, don't let that stuff stop you either. Hopefully that helps and I see you out there on the water uh, freezing your butt off with me this winter. Well, hopefully that juices you up or gives you some some ideas. That'll make them think it's sexy, sexy. Ooh.